Good morning and welcome to our service here at uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church. I invite you to get your hymnals and if you have them, if not, sing along with us. Uh, 171, More About Jesus. We'll sing the first, second, and last stanza. More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fall to see, more of his love who died for me, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fall to see, more of his love who died for me, more about Jesus let me learn, more of his holy will to son, spirit of God my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more Again, welcome to our service this morning. We're running at uh, very low staff this morning due to half our building being out of power. So we're trying to get that resolved so we can uh, be back to the full meeting here again next Sunday. All right, uh, let's see. In the way of a couple announcements, uh, first of all, so I don't forget it, is asking me to remind you that uh, 34 days, right? 34 days is uh, camp. I see that we have about 13 signed up for camp this year. So uh, we're trying to get um, uh, pre-registration done. So if you're planning to go, please make sure that you let me know. Um, also, we've got a new poster board that we're getting ready to put up uh, for our fifth fundraiser. And this one again is for uh, $50,000. So uh, praise the Lord, we got through the first four and we're into the fifth. and so. I, uh, you know, uh, praise God and prayerfully we'll see this one filled up quickly as well. And we get us that much closer to being able to build. Next Sunday, uh, again, that's uh, planned next Sunday. We'll have all the electric back on and have everything functional. And the electric isn't the problem. It's the well, well, electric is the problem right because now. we don't have the well. And if we don't have the well, we don't have the toilets. We don't have the water. We don't have any of that stuff that we need water for. So, um, so that's the problem is electric. Um, the pressure's on. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully we'll get that done here. And, and uh, I should also say uh, Wednesday night is uh, questionable uh, because we've got parts coming in so we can get them installed. And uh, so Wednesday night may be Facebook uh, only. So we'll, we'll know a little bit more as the week progresses. Okay. Those are announcements. Uh, prayer request. Um, prayer request. Be mindful of each other. You know, our church as a whole needs to uh, be lifted up by everyone. Um, and uh, just as Brother Ron mentioned in the Sunday school this morning, uh, we need to have love for our brethren, and that especially is for our church brethren, uh, lifting each one up um, every day. Any other prayer requests from anyone here in the room today? All right, well, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and again, thanking him and praising him for this blessed day. Uh, Brother Ron, would you lead us in our prayer? Our most kind, gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this church and what it stands for. Thank you so much for you giving your life for us, even though we did not deserve it. We thank you for our pastor and his preaching, teaching word. We thank you for all the teachers of this church. We thank you for the fellowship here. Lord, we pray for each one of the prayer requests that are on the hearts of each one of our members. You know what each one is. 
even though we don't know all, we do know that you know all and that your will will be done in each and every one of those. We ask that you forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. Help us to lift up our voice in the song of praise and be with our pastors who bring us your preaching word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's go to hymn 189. 189. You know, last time we did this was, uh, and I'm talking about having to deal with no no one here is about COVID. And I said, I don't want to ever do that again. So this is one of those COVID times. I don't want to ever do that again. There are a couple people. Yeah, I know, but I'm saying when we were just here by ourselves. Yeah, so. that was, that's tough. 189. When I see the blood, first, second, last stanza. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. All who receive him need never fear. Yes, he will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Chiefest of sinners, Jesus can say, as he has promised, so will he do. Oh, sinner, hear him, trust in his word. Then he will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Passion, oh, boundless love, Jesus of power, Jesus is true. All who believe are safe from the storm. Oh, he will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will. Pass over you. Sorry, I was phoned in there. 248. 248. Title of this hymn is Grace Greater Than Our Sin. 248. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is a stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is to see his face will you this moment his grace receive grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace that is greater than all our sin
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. you to get your Bibles this morning. If you will, open the book of Hebrews chapter 11. If you'll open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. This morning we're going to look at Heroes of Faith. Uh, this is the Memorial Day weekend. And um, we need to be very much reminded of all of those that have paid the ultimate sacrifices. But also at the same time I'm talking about those that have been in soldiers and different wars uh, to secure our... Uh, to secure us in our uh, land of freedom, but also at the same time be mindful of, as we're looking at this morning, the heroes of faith that gave their lives for the cause of Christ. We're going to be re again reading in verse 1 of chapter 11. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which were are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. They, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly, wherefore God, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. May we again pray. Our Father in heaven, as we again approach thy throne of grace this morning, we thank you so much for what your word continues to teach us about what it means to walk by faith and that it is impossible to please you without the faith. We thank you for the faith that you've given us, but it is our responsibility in your Son, Jesus Christ, not only unto salvation, but to subsequently following after salvation. I pray that you guide our hearts this morning. You know the need of each individual, and I pray that you guide my words, for it is in the name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. This weekend, again, is set aside for the time that our nation honors in memory those who have fought in previous wars uh, that have protected our country. We go back and we look at W. the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, the Iraq War, Libya, Afghanistan, uh, and you could even go back further to where you have the Civil War, you have the Revolutionary War, but people have paid the ultimate sacrifice for this, um, for this country. And we also need to understand that most of these wars were engaged, uh, that we've engaged in have been so with uh, volunteers, men and women, 
uh, that volunteered, that they truly understood what freedom meant. And not only is it worth fighting for, but it's worth dying for. Of all the wars that we've been involved in at home and abroad, we've engaged in those battles either as liberators, uh, coming to the aid of an ally, and on occasion we were forced into war. In fact, we go back and we look at Pearl Harbor as an example, or we look at 9-11, we were forced into a war. And then, but uh, the conclusion of each war, we did not become occupiers in the land. We did, though, assist in the reconstruction and in the rebuilding of these war-torn areas, but we were not occupiers. Even though that we left maybe a residual of soldiers there in that area uh, to help maintain the peace, we were still not occupiers. On this Memorial Day, we want to honor the memory of all those who have sacrificed their lives uh, on the altar of freedom. Those thousands of sacrificed lives were not given in vain. And because of their sacrifice, we are free today. And you think about what we have is we have the ability to have the to assemble without um, restrictions. We have the ability to move around our country without state borders. We have the ability uh, to live and to pursue our freedoms and happiness that we have. We're, we have the ability to assemble and worship our God. And think about the numbers of people that have lost their lives, given their lives in, in war. Is that if you, even if you go back to the Revolutionary War, 25,000 people died there. The Civil War, uh, about tore this country apart, 655,000 died during that time period. WW1, we lost 116,000. WW2, 405,000. Korean War, 36,000. Vietnam War, 58,000. The first Gulf War, the war in Afghanistan was 22,000. Iraq was 36,000. A lot of soldiers uh, gave their lives for this country. And I was preparing this message. I was drawn to Hebrews 11 because I believe it stands as a testament and a memorial for people who throughout the ages who truly understand the true meaning of freedom. Now, again, they, they went to battle to, and they defended this country so that we can maintain this life that we have here in this country. But we need to make sure we understand our government did not give us uh, the right to pursue happiness, freedom, and things of this nature. This comes from God. God himself was the one that ordained life. God ordained worship. God was the one that gave us our, the ability to speak. God gave us those things, but God also ordained government. So God gave us government. And what is the government's responsibility? Not to infringe upon the rights that God has given us, but is to protect and defend the rights that God has given us. Not to infringe, but to protect. And that's what we see. But Looking here in this, and so we, you know, we could talk all day about soldiers that have gone to war and people that have given their lives, but I want to talk about from the spiritual side of things is that those who have gone on before us and those who have, have stood for the faith, remember we have the God-given right to assemble, we have the God-given right to worship, and it is not to ever be infringed upon, and people have died in faith maintaining their faith, maintaining and being that, I'll call that foot soldier for Jesus, that foot soldier uh, that has served the Lord. And they were reminded of this as Romans 5 and 8 says, but God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, when we opened here in the text in Hebrews chapter 11, we read about several people that, you know, that were of the Old Testament time period and those people, as we saw, they died in faith. They were looking for a country that they had not had. Think about Abraham as an example. Abraham was called out uh, from the Ur of Chaldees and that, that Babylon area. He was called out. Now, why was he called out by God? God was going to use Abraham in a special way. But you need, need to understand, even though that Abraham lived in a very godless town or city, uh, and which was known for its um, uh, for all of the different idols that they have, is that we have to believe that Abraham was already a believer. 
in the Ur of Chaldees. Otherwise, God would not have used him to draw him out into uh, to, to, uh, where his promise would come to. When I want to talk about his promise, we're talking about uh, through Isaac and Jacob and going on down the, the, the bloodline to get to David where Jesus would end up sitting on, ultimately sitting on the throne of David. So we have, we have a believer that was in a very uh, idolic place, a very uh, with all, steeped with all kinds of idolatry. And the Lord said to Abraham, come out. And Abraham followed what the Lord would have him to do. And he but is always was looking forward to that place that one day he would have that city, that one day he would be able to be in that city where he would be, with, be able to be with the Lord face to face. I believe that he understood that he un ended up understanding about the ways of God and what was to look forward to with having a, re having a full relationship through his belief in Jesus Christ. That's why when we're, we study the scriptures and we understand, and the more that we understand by, because of the fact we have the benefit of not only the Old Testament, but we also have the benefit of the New Testament that we can read and understand is that not only was Jesus promised in the Old Testament, but he was fulfilled that promise by coming, being born as that of uh, the Virgin Mary, and then uh, living there as that, you know, for 33 years on this earth, growing up, and uh, he had favor with his father in heaven. Uh, he taught us what it meant to honor his father. He taught us what it meant to serve his father. He established his church, but ultimately he paid the ultimate sacrifice, which was on the cross of Calvary. He commended, he demonstrated, he showed his love by dying for us. And Peter writes this in 1 Peter 1 and 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again and to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, it was not just enough that Jesus paid the sin debt on the cross of Calvary. He also had to rise from the dead in order us to provide us eternal life. He paid the sin debt on the cross, arose from the grave, providing us eternal life. If he had just died, we would not have eternal life yet. We'd still have to have a Savior. We would still have to have a Christ that would come to fulfill what Scripture said. And that's why Peter went on to write in 1 Peter 3 and 15, he says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now, as a child of God, sanctify the Lord God and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in, and in fear. If we are going to be the free people, the freedom-loving people that we have because of salvation, we ought to be the ones that have always ready, always ready to give the hope that's within us and the reason for the hope that's within us. And we find is that, and not only that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've only had a couple of, uh, we've only had a couple of wartime periods that we actually drafted people. All the other times were volunteers. And those volunteers went, and that is what we ought to be, is people who are volunteers. I'm talking about children of God that are volunteers to be on the front lines, to be, as the Scripture says, to be the ambassadors that God would have us to be. The Scriptures also teach us, as soldiers of the Lord, we're not to entangle ourselves with the affairs of this world. Now, it doesn't mean we, we segregate ourselves off into some... Uh, some hobbit area over here, and I'm talking about that. I'm talking about the fact is that we don't entangle ourselves with the, the affairs. We live in this world. We live for the Lord. We deal with everyone that we deal with. We love everyone that we, that we come in contact with, but we ultimately show them the love of Christ. The same love that was shared with us about Jesus Christ, we share with those that need to hear. And by the way, everyone needs to hear about the love of Jesus Christ. And we should do that voluntarily. We should not have to be coerced. We should not have to be strong-armed to come and do that unto the Lord or for the Lord. John 8 and 31 says this, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believe on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so in, in other words, what we have to do is that the more we study God's word, the more that we will... Uh, gain a greater understanding of who the Lord is. And that should move us 
to then have a desire to share the love of Christ with others as we go throughout our daily lives. The Lord tells us in James 1 and 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. But you know, sadly, sadly, the average Christian today has been deluded into believing that all there is to Christianity is this, is just to trust in Jesus and to show up for services on Sunday. And I will tell you, that is not God's way. That is not living for the Lord. That is not being in His service. And many times our going to service on Sunday evening is that even is even out of when it's convenient. When it's convenient. Because we have so many things. We were talking about this yesterday working over here. Is that uh, there are so many distractions that we have today in this world. You know, when I was growing up, uh, most of the places where um, they had to, Sunday was what they called kind of the blue law. And what that meant was uh, there were nothing, nothing open except for hospitals. You might get a pharmacy. And that was about it. Gas stations were closed. Grocery stores were closed. Everything else was closed. You didn't even dare have even talk about having a sporting event on Sunday is that that was, you know, you want to have sporting events for schools and things of that nature? That was done during the week. It was done on Friday nights, done on Saturday. Uh, it was done during, during the week. Uh, you didn't miss, you did not uh, shut down for, uh, meaning I'm talking about, you didn't have these games on Sunday to where that you, uh, because it was going to infringe on going to service. Wednesday night, you didn't have games on Wednesday nights. It was Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That was the days that you could have these things. But you see, it's not the case today. We've, we've substituted church for all the things that are in the world. What does that mean for us as Christians? Should we cower down and say nothing? Actually, we should be speaking up. Because if we spoke up more, things might change. Uh, and, and, and we might be able to sway others to change as well. But I will tell you, one of the things also I find is that being a dedicated uh, soldier of the Lord, and I'm going to use that term today, is that if we deplete prayer, if we deplete study and application of God's word, then there will be no spiritual fruit. There will be no spiritual, ev no evidence of spiritual fruit. For the bulletin that you will eventually get today, uh, it gets handed out, and mailed out, things of that nature. One of the things I wrote in there was about the soldiers, the soldiers that guard the tomb uh, there uh, in Arlington. And those soldiers is that they have to go into uh, extensive training. In fact, for I think it's about six months when they sign up uh, and, and you're dedicated for, for two years. But the things that come after that is you're dedicated for life. But one of the things you'll find is that they spend five hours preparing their suits their, and I'm talking about suit, their military attire. It's five hours getting it ready just to go out to walk for the 30 minutes that they're out there. 21 walks, steps, 21 seconds to turn. They have to know they spend the first five months learning every important individual that's buried there in Arlington. I think there's 170 something that are identified that they have to learn. They have to learn their names. They have to learn why they're there. They have to learn some things about them, be able to recite them. During the time period, there's no watching TV. There's no cursing. There's no drinking. And by the way, when they leave after that two years, there's no cursing, no fighting, no drinking for the rest of their life. When they take the pledge, there's only been like 400 that have actually been able to don the pin that says, I was one of those soldiers. Very, very costly to do that. And, I will, and what I mean by that is that you're willing to volunteer. These are all volunteers that walk that course and remind us of that unknown soldier that they guard that tomb for. Now you say, why do you bring that up into this? Is because you see, if we don't have prayer in our lives as a child of God, if we don't have study as a part of our lives and application, and we don't do it with the the, the desire to do it, then I will tell you that we will forget about who we are very quickly. 
and will be easily drawn back in to the world, into the world. In fact, one of the things that, remember what we were reading in our opening text here, is that if we aren't reminded about where we came from, we will be reminded that we might want to go back. We have to, at times, reflect on where we were to say, you know, I don't want to go back to that place. I want to go forward looking for the Lord. And I'm not going to entangle myself with the ways of this world. And that's why Christianity is to be understood as not a one-time thing on that I get saved and I go to church on Sunday. It's a way of life, every day of our life, building our lives one stone at a time upon the Lord Jesus Christ and upon his word. And, and yes, this necessarily means that there are going to be times of trials and testings and hardships and failures. But the Lord calls upon us to be steadfast, to be unmovable. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And Hebrews 6 and 19 tells us, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that, or entereth into that within the veil. Now, back in our text here in Hebrews chapter 11, as we opened this text, we read about people that by faith, they served the Lord. By faith, they gave their lives and souls to the Lord. In fact, in verse 1 again of our text, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And verse 6 again says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And every verse that we read, going all the way through to verse 16, is that they all talked about, by faith, they did these things. By faith, they, they served the Lord. By faith, they walked after the Lord. Let's go back to verse 13 again of our text. It says, these all died in faith. They all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he that hath prepared for them a city... And you see, for we who have trusted in Christ by faith and we follow by faith is that we have the promise of the Lord. You know, the, the you say, well, what is the promise of the Lord? One of the greatest promises that we have, you know, when the Lord returned back to heaven and right well, before he returned to heaven, he said this, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And when I come again, I'll do what? I'll receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You see, as a child of God, as a child of God, I know that I have a home prepared by the Lord for when I come into his presence. I know that when I'm talking about when I come into his presence for all of eternity, when I pass from this life into the next, I know without a shadow of a doubt, he has a home prepared for me. In fact, when we study scripture, we find is that, that, that there is enough room in heaven for all human beings. Unfortunately, many human beings choose not to go to heaven. And that's why it says in scripture also that hell has to be enlarged. Hell was never ever created for mankind. Right. Hell was created for one set of beings, fallen angels. That's it. Lucifer led a third of the angels to walk away from God, to become evil. They're, they're called demons. They're called devils. He himself is called that dragon, that, that devil, that uh, accuser. He's, all of these names identify who he is. And the Lord says there is only one God, and you're not it, Lucifer. I am God, because Lucifer wanted to become God. He wanted to become higher than God. Hell was created for Lucifer and that third of the angels are called the fallen angels. And that was it. But the scripture tells us this, is that hell has to be enlarged. Why would you have to enlarge it anything? It was already a fixed space of time. It's because there are those who refuse to trust in Jesus as their Savior during this lifetime 
And then they end up in a devil's hell for all of eternity. And that's why when we look at, you know, and, and, and I look at this as a, from the statement is that all of these people here we're reading about in Hebrews chapter 11, by placing their faith and believing in God, they had been given liberation. They had been given freedom. And from that, they by faith then served the Lord. And notice again what it said in verse 13. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. You see, you didn't have to coerce them to serve God. You didn't have to uh, twist their arms. They were ready and willing to die for the cause of Christ. And they knew what they had been saved from. You see, we're all, we all deserve hell, every one of us. But thank the Lord that Jesus came. It's what it says in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus Christ, shall be saved. Not only shall you be saved, but you're no longer what? Condemned to hell. You're no longer condemned to a devil's hell, but we've been freed for all of eternity. Look at our text as we continue reading. Is that verse 17 went on to say, goes on to say, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob, and Esau concerning things to come. Now I want to think about Abraham for just a moment. Abraham went up until right at 100 years of age with no children. Sarah was at 99, or 90 rather, no children. Past childbearing time period. And yet, now we know that uh, Sarah and Abraham uh, thought that they would circumvent God and, you know, brought, uh, uh, brought the the Ishmaelite in, I think it should, well, Ishmael was the name, but what was his mother's name? Hagar, Hagar thank you. Uh, so brought Hagar in, and she was a concubine. She was a servant, and there was a child born who was called Ishmael, but that's not who God had intended. Right. And it wasn't until like 13 years roughly later that we find then that actually God says, now it's time. God says, now it's time for you to have a child. And so we have this child Isaac that was born unto Abraham. And as he was growing up, and he was, uh, I believe at this time period, he was probably a teenager. He could have overtaken his dad at probably any time. If nothing else, he could have ran away. But the Lord says, I want you to offer your son, your only son, that God had promised was going to have a seed that was going to come through him that was going to be innumerable. And Abram's name was changed to Abraham, which meant father of nations. First it was changed, first his name meant father, but he had no child. Then it was changed to Abraham, which meant father of nations. And he says, I have no children. And then I have, and I'm going to have a nation out of this child? And now you're asking me to do what? Sacrifice this child? And Abraham, in his faith of God, took Isaac up to this mountaintop, and Isaac asked, Dad, I see the fire, I see the wood, but where is the sacrifice? Abraham responded, God will provide. God will provide the sacrifice. And he took Isaac up there, and he bound him up there, laid him on, the, on that altar, and just as he was ready to thrust in the knife into his son, his only son, God says through the angel, do thy son no harm. Now, remember what we were reading. It says there as we were reading in our text in verse 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, which hence also he received him in a figure. In other words, what we have here is that Isaac represented Christ in a figure. And Abraham had enough faith in his heart, his mind, his life, that even if he was to thrust that knife into Isaac and he died, that God was somehow going to raise him up because of the very fact is that he said, I he says that your child is going to be a seed from which many nations are going to come forth and the Messiah was going to come forth. 
he had enough faith. And that's kind of belief. And I will tell you, I will tell you this very emphatically. If Abraham had not have been walking with the Lord throughout his life, there's no way he had had this type of faith. He would have said, you got to be kidding me, God. Surely you don't mean what you say. Surely I'm going to kill my child and be done with him. He had to have been walking by faith that when this trial came, when this time came, is that he would go forth believing. This is not blind faith. This is knowing faith. This is trusting faith. And so he went forth. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. That was the children that were born unto, unto him. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, verse 21, blessed both the sons of Joseph, one of his children, and worship, learning upon the top, or leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made, it, uh, made it, uh, mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Remember how God had orchestrated and brought Jacob and his family down into Egypt. They came into Egypt 75 strong, which isn't very many. But what did they live there for over 400 years? And then God brought them out to birth them as a nation called Israel. And what we find is that when they came out of Egypt, they went in 75 and came out anywhere between 1.5 and 2 million people. That's what God did in that 400-year period. God orchestrating, God guiding. And then we find and look at um, verse 23. Verse 23 goes on to say, By faith Moses, Moses, uh, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. You got to understand what was happening is that Egypt was growing. I mean, uh, Egypt looked at the nation. Well, they weren't called the nation yet. But they looked at these Hebrews. They looked at these people and Herod said that these folks are going to do what? If we go to battle with another country, these folk may side with that other country and overthrow us. So what did they do? They put them into heavy labor, heavy bondage. And, and as a result is that, you know, things got very hard on the people there of who would become the nation of Israel. And then the edict went out. Is that Herod said, or I should say Pharaoh said, Pharaoh made the statement. He said, I want all the male boys uh, when they're birthed, to be killed because we don't want to be raising soldiers. I want all the male boys. And, and they said to the midwives of the Hebrews is that when these children are born, these boys are born, I want you to kill them. We want them gone. Well, the midwives didn't listen to what Pharaoh had to say. And so as a result is that the, the, these children were born, but they would still hunt them down and kill these boys. Well, Moses' mother and father knew what was going to potentially happen. And his mother, I'm sure his father, were both praying about this child, that God could maybe use this child. And we know that they made this little ark of bulrushes, put it into the water. The Pharaoh's daughter that was bathing herself down by the river's brink heard the child, they got the child, and she took the child and raised it as her own. But you see, one of the things that happened in all of this that what ended up happening was that God was directing. We know that Miriam went and watched and went up to the daughter and said, would you like one of the Hebrew mothers to uh, start to raise the child for you for a period of time? She said, yes, I would, and I'll pay her wages. She got paid for basically raising her own child for a period of time. Went to until he was weaned. But what do you think happened during that time period? Now, you have to understand, weaning for a child in that day and age might have been three years of age, might have been as much as five years of age. During that time, I truly believe they taught him about the Lord. In fact, is that God was probably going to use him as a deliverer. And so he went, Moses went to live there with Pharaoh's house. He had the best education. He had the best of everything. There's been, there's been writings that he was even uh, instrumental in wartime and leading wartime for Egypt. Uh, he was, might have been even next in, as an heir of the throne of Pharaoh. And so he had learned all these things. He had learned about 
uh, nations, he had, a, a nation, what it, what it meant to operate a nation. He had learned what it meant to be a leader. He had learned what it meant to be, a, a, in a way, a ruler. Uh, but one of the things was he also learned, still understood that God had a special plan for his life. And in fact, it says in verse 23, well, go back and read the entire verse here. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, notice what he did, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So what we find here is that here is that that he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Christ or treasures in Egypt. You know, one of the things that that we find is as living a life for Christ, and, and you find this all throughout this, this chapter, is that these people of faith, they lived in the world, but they didn't live in the world in, in the sense that they that they were so consumed and loved the world. They lived in the world, and but they loved God. They loved God above the world. And by faith, they and even when it became hard, when it became hard for e any of these individuals, in fact, for Moses, he could have had, again, he had the best education, best food, best, best clothing, and yet he forsook those things to do what? To be a servant of God. Whatever God wants me to do, I'm going to do it. You see, that was a volunteer. But you see, it came to making a choice to do what? That he was going to give his life unto God. That's why it says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. He could have had all the worldly things, all the worldly treasures, but he says what's more important is the things of God and serving of God and living for God. And that's what I want to give my life for. In fact, it says in verse 27, by faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He had a relationship with God and God could use him because of that relationship. Now that goes to tell us this. It tells us this, is that if we want to be used of God, we need to be a servant of God. Right. You can't just, God's just not going to one day say, well, I want to use you, and you've been doing what? You're not living for God. I'm talking about children of God. I'm talking about people who have trusted in Christ as Savior. When you're doing nothing for the Lord, your life does not reflect what a child of God is to be about. Your life doesn't reflect anything about God. In fact, the Lord tells us this. He said this, Jesus said this himself in the, his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6 and 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or things of this world. You have to choose. Are you going to serve the world or are you going to serve God? You can't serve them both. And there's, and there's too many people that have been doing what? They have put their toes in the world and said, I want to get as close as I can to the world and then try to serve God. It's not going to happen. Right. It's not going to work. You will have no fruit. There will be no spiritual fruit. And I will tell you, the Lord tells us that, that if we're, in fact, I'm going to go back and read what it said in verse 6. Again, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. And that faith is not just to get saved. That faith is for daily living. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What does that mean, diligently seek him? I'm looking for that home. I'm watching, I'm waiting, I'm logging. I know where it's at, but I'm looking for it. And until I get there, until, you know, the Apostle Paul, he made this statement while he was here. He says, it is needful for me to stay here for a period of time to teach you about the ways of the Lord. But I will tell you, as soon as the Lord is done with me, I'm ready to go home to the Lord. Absent from this body, present with the Lord. He always had a vision of being with the Lord. He always had a vision of being able to see him face to face. But he said, as long as I am here, I will stay at my post. As long as I'm here, I will stand at my post and continue to do the work that you've called me to do. And in fact, Colossians chapter 3 and 24 says, knowing that the day of the Lord 
you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Revelation 22 and 12 says, And behold, I, will co I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. We have to make a choice in this life between living honestly, and this has to be on a daily basis, living honestly or cheating in business and in education. We have to choose daily between telling the truth and telling a lie. And I will tell you, it is easier to tell, the tr to tell a lie many times than it is to tell the truth. You know why we, why we get ourselves into where, when I make that statement? is because oftentimes we tell a lie because we don't want to offend someone. We don't want to hurt someone. I will tell you this. You can tell someone the truth in love, or you can tell someone the truth out of anger. Now, the both are true, but I will tell you, you tell someone the truth out of anger, they're not going to accept it. In fact, they're going to hate you for telling them. But if they understand that you care about their well-being, that you care about and you love them, and you want the best for them, is that even though that it may, the truth may sting, is that most often it's better accepted. They may reject it at first, but it's still most often accepted because of the fact they knew that you cared about them. How about living in uh, morality and immorality? It's not hard to live in immorality. It's not. Many times it's hard to live in morality. How about living in obedience and disobedience to God? It's easy to live in disobedience to God. It is. As I said, Sunday service is often a out of convenience we go because of so many distractions in this world today. And living in, in our marriages and, you know, honorably or dishonorably, things of this nature, living and living uh, in or out of the church fellowship. You know, one of the things is that the Lord tells us in his word, he says to forsake not the assembling of ourselves. The Lord's day, we're supposed to be in his house. We're supposed to be uh, we're supposed to be exhorting one another, provoking one another to love and good works, the scripture tells us. But when we stay out, because you know it's, uh, they won't miss me today. I'll tell you right now, you're missed every time you're not here. But the question is, when you're out, do you miss us? That's a whole different question as well that ought to be asked. Or is it so easy to say, well, they'll, I don't, they'll get along without me. Well, no, you're a part of this body. Part of this body, you're supposed to be here. Because without you is that we're not whole. With you, we're whole. And that's why we need to understand what the scripture teaches us. Look back at our text. It says here that by faith, talking about Moses, he forsook Egypt. Verse 28, through faith he kept the Passover and sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as, as by dry land which the uh, Egyptians attempting to do were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. After that, they were compassed about seven days. And think about what happened there is that, you know, the Lord says this, when they, when they actually got to uh, across the River Jordan and they got to Jericho, which was going to be their really the first test of following the Lord. And the Lord, you know, they had these big walls around this, this place of Jericho. It was a fortified city. And the Lord often gives us things to do that just we don't have an understanding about his bigger plan. And he told him, he says, I want you to march around. Take the people and march around the city one time. Day one. March around the city one time. Day two. This went on for six days. And on the seventh day, he says, now I want you to march around the city seven times. And then here's what I want you to do. You're going to be ready for battle. And they're going to blow the horn and they're going to uh, make a statement about that this is the day of the Lord. And the walls came down. I don't believe the walls went down this way. I believe the walls just went down in the ground. You say, well, why do you say that? Because of the fact uh, there happened to be a woman on the top of the tower. And her name was Rahab. If the walls had have fallen down, because you see, she was, a, she was a prostitute. But you see, she had hid the spies. And we'll see that here in just a minute. She had hid spies that came in from the Israelites. And... She hid them, and then she let them down out the window. And I truly believe that the walls had fallen down, like we often think about falling down and crumbling down, is that how would she have been saved? Meaning, how would she have not died in that crumbling? That's why, that's why I personally believe the walls just went down in the ground and, and exposed the city. And they were able, able to go in and overthrow the city and took over the city. As we continue reading here is that, by faith, the harlot Rahab, verse 31, 
perish not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And you know about Rahab? Here we have a Gentile is actually in the lineage of Christ. So just as Ruth was, Ruth was a Moabitess in that she came and ended up marrying Boaz. And as a result, she is in the lineage of Christ. So we have some uh, two non-Jewish women that are in the lineage of Jesus Christ. By this cause, by faith, they trusted. By faith, they believed. And it says here, and in verse 32, it says, and what, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in, in fight, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. So what do we have here is that by faith, these people stood in the trenches. If you go back and you study as an example about Daniel, Daniel was told to do what? For 30 days, a decree went out. Do not, uh, this is from Nebuchadnezzar. Do not, or no, that was from um, uh, Cyrus. Or Darius. I'll get my guys in, in right. <laughs> my mind is running. He was told this edict. Do not pray for 30 days. If you do pray, pray unto the king. But you see, he had a habit of praying three times a day, not to the king. I will tell you, he was probably praying for the king, but not to the king, because the king could not answer anyone's prayer. Not any idol could answer anyone's prayer. What ended up happening, though, was this. He did as he did every day. He opened the windows. Not out of show, just this was his daily routine. And he prayed unto the Father. He prayed unto God. And as a result, he was taken and thrown into the lion's den. In that lion's den, they thought he was going to die and perish. But we find is that the Lord closed the lion's mouth. And he came out alive. By faith, he was put there. By faith, he was saved there. By faith, he came out of there. Then we have Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, three Hebrew, three, Hebrew, three Hebrew children that you know by the name of their or Chaldean names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men were told by the king, do not, uh, or bow down and worship my image. And they said, what? We cannot bow down and worship your image because we're called by God to do what? Worship the one and true and living God. And he got angry and threw them into a fire that was heated seven times hotter than it ever had been heated. And what ended up happening is that they were thrown in and they survived and they walked out. They said, if God requires our life, we will die this day there, but we know where we're going to be. Without a shadow of a doubt, we know where we're going to be. If the Lord wants us to tarry, he will bring us out, but you, king, cannot take our lives. They were thrown in, and they walked out. They were, they were called out. They came out. You see, these people had trusted in the Lord. These people had placed their faith in the Lord, and they had stood in faith. Look at verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not, ex not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. And you know, one of the things is, if you go back and you, and you study, even like in the, in the Book of Martyrs, if you've ever taken a glance at that, is that there was a man that, that was, I read about, his name was Rawlings White. Rawlings White was a poor fisherman who after obtaining a fair knowledge of Scripture and trusting in the Lord, is that he became a preacher himself. And, he, and his mission field was to uh, the rough fishermen companions that he had uh, formerly associated with. And one day, one of the bishops of the Church of England brought charges against White. The bishop charged this preacher with not only being a heretic himself, but a spreader of heresy among others. Now, what caught my eye about this man is that they attempted to get him to recant his so-called heresy. 
which was not heresy at all, but heresy at all because he was preaching the word of God correctly. And through the punishment, you know, so they, 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 they tried to get, he would keep saying to them, if I have been preaching heresy, take the scriptures and show me the heresy. But it was never done. He was told if you don't change and recant of this heresy, we're going to burn you at the stake. White showed no sign of fear at this rebuke and this threat. He proceeded to tell the bishop again that he was a Christian and that he held, doc, he held to no doctrines that, con, that were contrary to Scripture. And he went on to state that if he did, again, he begged, convince me, show me, show me where I've erred and I will change my way. But the bishop offered no biblical text. He just stated, White, you're teaching things contrary to the Scriptures and true religion. Double quote that word, religion. He wouldn't change, and he was burned at the stake for what he believed in, what he stood for. You see, standing in faith means that whatever the cost is, I'm going to follow through with it. And when you find from what we were studying or reading about, these all died in faith. In fact, as we are reading here, they, they suffered, many suffered cruel mocking, scourgings, Bonds, imprisonment, verse 37, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. So what we find here is that even though they went through these things in faith, they were still reminded of the same thing we are, is that as a child of God, the minute that you pass from this life into the next, you have a home with the Lord. And we're promised that. But we're also promised the, the opposite. If you don't trust in Christ, and the minute you pass from this life into the next, is that you're going to spend an eternity apart from the true and living God. And that also comes as, uh, you know, it's one or the other. But it has to be decided in this lifetime. And we're only given one lifetime. There is no do-overs. There is no go-backs. There is no uh, seeing what, you know, maybe I'll get out of this in some period of time after I've been, uh, you know, sitting in some place for some period of time in some pit hole then I'll get out. The Lord says, no, mm -hmm. there's a gulf that's fixed and there's not one way in or out is that you're there forevermore. And you know, one of the things that we find is that, that I look at this, we read about these heroes, we call them the heroes of faith. We read about all the things they stood for. But you know, I have to ask this question and bring this to closure this morning. But what about us? Because, you see, it's one thing to read about them. They made their choice. But what about us? What is our choice? What are we doing for the Lord? Are we doing serving the Lord by faith? Are we following after His ways by faith? Are we, uh, and it, even if it's potentially going to cause us our lives? And, and think about where we are today in this time period. I will tell you, this country is, is at a boiling point. This country right now is at a very much of a, a boiling point to where that it, for, for many Christianity is wanting to be pushed by the wayside. More and more politicians, you hear them where they would have never said this in the past. They're saying things and making statements like this. You Christians are hatred people. You're a hateful people. You stand against uh, truth. And, and what they're saying is you don't want us to be able to live the way we want to live. And so as a result, you're speaking out against what we're doing. That makes you a hateful person because I should be able to do what I want to, when I want to, where I want to, whenever I want to. And you're standing over here in the way because you keep saying, know the truth and the truth will set you free. You're all sinners in need of a savior. I don't want to hear that. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I think I'm okay. I'll do what I want to with my life. You are narrow, bigoted, hateful people. 
And that's how they're trying to frame Christianity. You know why? Again, and this is all Satan's work, to try to push uh, children of God into a box to where they will become the trolls that I talked about earlier, to say nothing. Get out of this place. Get out of this world. Get out of politics. Get out of life. Get out of business. Get out of education. Get out of this world. We do not want to hear of what you are trying to sell us. But the Lord said this, always be ready to give the reason for the hope that's within you and always be willing to do what? Go you therefore teach all nations that they are what? In need of a savior. And once they've been one to the Lord, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and then teach them about how to live in faith. How to live in faith, to be that disciple that God would have us to be. We are called here to be faithful. We are to be like Isaiah. When the Lord says, who shall I send? Who shall I send? And Isaiah responded, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. But you see, again, Christianity is not a one-time week, a week time of service. It is a lifetime of service. Here am I, send me. Look at verse 1 of chapter 12. There's a couple of verses I want to finish with here this morning because I believe this now brings us to us and what we need to look at. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So who are those witnesses? Those witnesses are the ones that came before us out of chapter 11. We have all of these witnesses that came before us. Now it's our time. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And how are we going to do that? It says in verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. I will tell you, being a soldier, being walking that post is hard at times. Think about soldiers that have to walk that, 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 that time during their, uh, in the wee hours of the morning by yourself at times, walking in the middle of the dark, tired, no one else around you, but you're there. As a child of God, even though you're on your post, even though you're walking where the Lord would have you, the one thing that's different than a soldier in the army is that you are never alone. You always have the Lord walking with you. You are always formidable because of the fact that you have the Lord within you and walking with you and being steadfast, unmovable. And as Hebrews 12 and 28 says, wherefore we receive, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We are living in obedience when we follow the Lord. But it has to be voluntarily. I can't force you to be a soldier. There is no draft. Now the draft is, I'm calling you. I'm calling you to serve. But you see, it has to be voluntarily. If you go back to Vietnam, as an example, that war, uh, you're 18 and your number came up, you're going. You're going. The lottery hits your number, you're going. There was very few people that got out of it. But you see, in the call of the Lord's work, he wants volunteers. Here am I, send me. That's who he wants to serve. The question is, are we willing to become a hero of faith in our own right? That the Lord could say to us, well done. Now, good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Let us stand. Ask Brother Ryan, would you come up and, and play and, and lead us in a hymn of invitation this morning? Don't, don't worry about playing. Just lead us in a hymn. Hymn 524. Here you go. Sing hymn 524. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. 
received a blessing from our service this morning, our message. So don't forget our afternoon uh, service at 3, and you're preaching out of where this, this afternoon? Amos 3.3. Amos 3.3. Heard that one quite often uh, yesterday, didn't we? Mm -hmm. So don't forget that, and pray that we'll uh, get our uh, electric back up and running for uh, our next service. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father in heaven, just again, we thank you so much for this time that we had to come and to gather around your word and Lord for each one that's here and each one has been listening online dear Lord and we just thank you for this uh, this day and we we're just reminded of of these that walk by faith that followed after you that served you even when it, it caused them their lives Lord as we go into this new week we go in this uh, this time back into our respective uh, areas of work and school and things of this nature Lord I pray that we'll Make that choice and decision to look at your son, Jesus, walk according to your word, live the life that you would have for us to live. But Lord, it starts in faith. It starts receiving by receiving your son as Savior and then willing to follow for a lifetime of service, a blessed life of service that we've been called to. Guide and direct us for the name of Jesus. We ask these things. Amen.